You had me a little worried. I thought you didn't know where the Nebraska was for a while, boss. Good morning, everybody. I'll just run this through real quick. I, uh, I'd like to have input from members over the country rather than listening to us that you have to listen to all the time. I'm primarily responsible working in the state of Nebraska. I've got one grain rep and 16 grain coordinators that are just starting to take a hold real good. You heard one of them last night. And I don't know if he realized uh, we're going to have to increase our production a little bit if we're going to have more checkoff than gross sale in Illinois or we'll have to raise the marketing expense a little. <laughs> we are, the, in Nebraska, down through the center of the state, basic south, south central through the Platte Valley has been corn corn and corn and western part is wheat. The eastern third is a soybeans, wheat, variety of other crops. The part of Nebraska that you should be concerned as corn growers over the country is the sand hills because where it used to take 40 acres for a cow and a calf, they're putting up center pivots on it like you've never seen them going down and raising 130 to 140 bushel corn on them. And that is probably where the price of corn is controlled in the United States more than any place else because this is all new corn that they ship wherever they want to do what they want with. I think that I'd just like to give you what's going on. We've had the best grain coordinator meetings. As I said, Bill Beebe is going on in the last two or three months and I think he's typical of the enthusiasm of people wanting to get something done. We have been a, an organization that has been a marketing organization up until now and I think leaving this convention, we're going to be, we've been marking time, waiting for everybody to decide, I suppose, that this is what we have to do. The people that have known what NFO is, have marked time, and now we're gonna go from here. Because everybody realizes we've got to do it ourselves. We're going to become, starting next Monday, a collective bargaining organization instead of a marketing organization. And that's, I think, that's what we're all sitting here for. I think that we, we have to realize one thing, the one thing that is out there more predominant than anything else that I run into is everybody compares their price to their local elevator. Well, I'll tell you that's, let me, let me give you an idea of how you might be able to counteract that. What you and I do about the price is not going to be done at our local elevator. It's what this organization sells to the ultimate producer or the processor to the feedlots, out to California. The price is established there if you are a factor in the moving up of the price. If we sell to the processor for 10 cents a bushel be more because we have a big block, then he can buy it from the independent producer, then we are a factor and we'll start moving the market up. And the bigger the block, the more we can start commanding a price. If you're comparing the price, or the member is, to the local elevator, that's not the bargainer's fault. That's not NFO's fault. That's yours and my fault. The marketing expense is too high, and you're, you and I are the only one that can cure that, and that's with production. It has nothing to do, the local, you can't compare local price. Because the bargainers and nobody else has an effect in it. You and I have to take care of that with production out in the area. So when somebody tells you, well, I got a nickel less at the elevator, well, hell, how much more did you get at the processor? That's what's going to determine whether we get the price, cost of production, or whether we be beggars as we've been in the market. So I think that we have to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. We've got to go out and sell the idea of collective bargaining, not merchandising. And that's what I think, why we have the enthusiasm of the people in the country. They are starting to understand what they are going to do and that they have to do it themselves. And until a member understands that, we're never going to get the job done with him. And if he never understands it, then go get another one because I'll tell you, these young guys are a lot easier to talk to and we've marked time in NFO and we've got to get these boys in there because they're the same thing as you and I were 15 to 20 years ago. And if we don't get them in there, we won't survive. So I've never 
the enthusiasm is the best it's ever been in the state of Nebraska because somebody wants to get something done. And I think looking out and talking to people, that's what we all want to do. We'll, uh, we'll do our part. We're going to get it put together. I've, in the last two weeks, we've purchased and are in the process of purchasing two elevators in the southeastern part of Nebraska. And the members are putting money into the elevator, and we won't let them be a part of it unless they sign three years of production right there and commit themselves 100%. And I'd like to close it with this. You know, there's a lot of different people out here. There's a lot of people that are just like the chicken and the pig that we're going to furnish breakfast. For the chicken to furnish the eggs, it's a little inconvenience. But for the hog to produce the bacon for that breakfast, he's got to be fully committed. Thank you. Leroy Reckner needs to see Curtis Haugen here over by the door on my right. Okay, let's, uh, Leland, are you, uh, you'll probably be busy shortly. This is Leland Townsend from Michigan, up in the Flint area. Let's hear it for Michigan. Thank you, Ralph. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as you can see on the map, uh, I'm over the Mitten area there in the United States and down in the South Bend marketing area in the upper corner of Indiana. There are six counties in Michigan that are included in the South Bend marketing area and of course Michigan is the Flint marketing area. We raise about everything in them areas. Cherries, apples, grain, dairy, hogs, cattle, sheep, edible beans from the navies to the cranberries to the dark light red kidneys. We've got a, f a host of, of crops that we raise in that area. Can you hear me back here now? In the grain program, we discovered several years ago that to get 30% of the production moving, we was loading rail cars up there, bringing them in, loading them through an auger. Not only do we have a variety of crops, we get a variety of weather in that state also, be surrounded by the lakes. Anyway, from the zeros in the wintertime to 100 degrees in the summertime. So, a lot of snow in the winter also. Makes it a little difficult getting the rail cars around and trackside loading. 1974, some of the members decided they ought to have their own facilities. We tried working with existing facilities in there and that didn't pan out too good. So in 74, a group of farmers up in the northwest side of the state decided to form a corporation, a cooperative, and build their own elevator. If I can have the lights dimmed and the overhead shut off, I will just give you uh, some slides I have here on two facilities they built, one in 1974 and the other one in 1976. And, uh, This is up in the Scottville area, Mason County. The sign out at the road reads NFO Acres. It was started in uh, 1974, like I stated. This is the driveway in the facility. Uh, you can just faintly see the bends way in the background. Are we going to get the lights? No, it cannot be raised. The overhead is propped up till they won't fall down if we raise it anymore. So you may just, they're only going to take a few minutes here if you want to stand up and look at the back there. You, there's a picture of the rail car, some of the, uh... all righty, can you steady her there, Verl, one of my county coordinators. <laughs> Just another shot of the trucks lined up in uh, the first year of operation there. There is the dump pit in between the bends, the dryers, the overhead loadout tanks. Go ahead, bro. Here's a shot from up on one of the legs of the line of trucks coming in there. That's corn from corn harvest there. There's where they load the offices in the background there. Uh, Fines tank, a closer shot of the office. This is the second year of operation. They put up an additional tank. Them 
the, the larger one are 110,000 bushel tanks there. Here's another shot of the trucks uh, going down the line there. Shows a total view of the, the facility. Out on the siding, and by the way, the farmers up there built their own rail siding, bought the rails, the tracks, and uh, there's a 10-car siding in it at this facility here on a Chesapeake and Ohio line. Here's another shot of the rail cars of the downspout coming out to load them. This is from the top of the leg, showing the 140-foot downspout coming down into the, the hopper cars. Okay, this is a driveway uh, of the Cass City facility, the NFO thumb area. It's up in the thumb area of the state. Um, this was built in the summer of 1976. This is on 37 acres of the property there. This is a shot of the grand opening, the driveway, the facility setting in the background there. It was kind of a, getting to be a dark day. Uh, just in the left there, you see the office building. In front there is a rock as big as a pickup truck. So uh, we have some conditions to work around in Michigan as far as farming also. Go ahead. <clears throat> this is another shot of facility. Them legs are 140 feet high there. The rail siding is, the stones are just being prepared there on the left, down the left or lower left corner. There's another shot. This, these farmers built their own rail siding. There's room for 12 cars there. Go ahead, bro. This is a picture from the top of the leg looking down on the office out towards the road as the farmers enter the facility. This is a shot of the rail siding as it curves in off the main line of the Grand Trunk Western, which is a Canadian-owned line we have in that area there now. Uh, we have gravity cleaners on these legs that uh, clean the fines and the dirt out of the grain as uh, it comes in from the farm and also as it, it's cleaned again as it goes on the rail cars. There's a shot looking down at the uh, holding tanks. Uh, we have to dry all our corn in Michigan is harvested. They start in that year there, 35% moisture corn and we had to take her down to 15. We burn a lot of gas up there drying corn. That's the unloading pit for the wet grain down there. Top of the bends, crosswalks on them, cushion boxes protect the grain going in. Fines tanks there that uh, collect the fines that we sell out to feed lots in the area. This is an overall shot of the facility there. It was just started. It's expanded a lot since then. Shows the wet holding tanks and the grain dryers there. There is some big bins being put up. You know, they build the roof first and then just jack them up and add the rings. Them are 130,000 bushel. There is uh, only about 250,000 storage on this place as we build it. This is just another shot of the dryers. Another shot of the big bins being uh, erected. Uh, the gas tanks, the wet holding tanks. Here's a shot of the the rail siding looking from where the cars are loaded out towards the road. There's room for 12 cars there. This is where the stones are being piled yet, and the, the farmers built this one themselves when it was 90 degrees. There's a turnaround track on the north side of the siding there uh, where we loaded some cars. This is just a shot of the, the hopper car there. This is after some of the big tanks are erected. The siding's all completed. In 77, these slides were taken. There's a hopper car sitting there. Um, an additional tank was put up this year. Just a newer shot of the, the dryers there. This is where the farmers come in. There's semi scales there. They're uh, 80 ton, 70 feet long. Uh, we sometimes have farmers with gravel trains that come in hauling grain there. This is the farmer's truck on the scales as he's leaving there. Another shot of the legs. Here's the uh, hopper cars on the siding there uh, waiting to be loaded out. There's cars being loaded now. The one sitting down there on the track is on a... Uh, 
300,000 pound rail scale. We weigh our own cars out right there. Uh, selling a lot, two continental grains, the East Coast, they buy on our weights and grades right there at the facility. There's the uh, spout going into the car being loaded. This is another shot of the dryers there. Bonnie is a secretary that's been there for three years since we built the facility, uh, taking care of all the paperwork in that office. And with the facility now, that's the end of them, Verily, and shut it off. The, they have advanced that facility three times since we built it. Scottville's been advanced three times so, since we built that. It took just two in the state to get the farmers in a bargaining position there. Since then, if you've been reading your reporter, in the five cooperatives we have in the state of Michigan, the members own seven elevators. That got us in a position this year, I was able to go around to the biggest cooperatives in the state of Michigan and sign handling agreements. They want to deal with us now. They want to handle our products. Issue farmers warehouse receipts, specifying an out charge, we like to do business in these places. We'll sell grain to them, but we want the option to be able to pull it out, send it to East Coast, or as we're presently doing, putting together some barge sales to go down to Ohio and Indiana at the barge site and deliver grain out of the country. We've had a lot of enthusiasm in the state. The farmers are determined to do things on their own. I have uh, six coordinators uh, working now. I've got 12 lined up to work this winter. So we're gonna get the production signed up as it's out on the farm, because farm storage went up in the state of Michigan all over as it did in a lot of areas of the country. We feel the farmer's in the best bargaining position he's ever been in. She's on the farm where it ought to be. All we need to do is get the rest of it signed up, what we don't have now and get it on our program, moving through the NFO nationwide with all the other states, and March 1st can really be a reality for us. Thank you for your time. Okay, Mike, let's have you up here next, okay? This is Mike Summers from the state of Missouri. While he's on the way up, will you pass your contracts for sale that you filled out, or all of them, into the center aisle so that they can be picked up? We'll have them totaled up, and then we will uh, get them into the proper offices around the country. Okay, Mike? Yeah. Thank you, Ralph. Ladies and gentlemen, it makes me feel good to be here today to talk to you just a little bit about what's going on. I'm more or less responsible for the northern part of Missouri and in that area why we raise corn, soybeans, a little wheat, not too much, and some milo. As you know in the nor northern part of Missouri that we have terminals in our area where we can go into St. Louis, we can also go into Kansas City and St. Joe. These are our terminal markets. Our wheat, milo, and beans go to those points a lot of times. Sometimes we might load some, some beans out. Corn is, normally speaking, would go south into uh, our feeders in the south where the, where the market is better there. The last several years, our farmers have put up an awful lot of storage, and we've got this grain stored on the farm. But I remember when we didn't have about five people working in the grain department. We didn't even have too much of an organization throughout the country. And I'm going to tell a little story that one of my cousins told me when we first started NFO back in 58 in my home county. We didn't have about 15 members, I think, in our county at that time. And I was telling him how this was going to work. 
and he argued with me. He's quite a bit older than I was. He says, no, Mike, it won't work that way. He says, you're going to have to take and organize every county in the state of Missouri. And he says, when you get that organized, he says, then you're going to have to take the leadership out of the state of Missouri and organize the other states. And he says, you're going to have to go nationwide. But he says, when you get the states in California and on the West Coast and on the East Coast, you get them organized, you will probably have to come back and organize, reorganize a few counties in the state of Missouri. But he says, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this is what he said. When you're ready to do that, he says, watch out. The damn thing is going to work pretty quick. And I see it happening. Let's get it on a contract for sale. Okay, is there any other that have to be leaving shortly? Okay, let's just uh, keep coming down the line then. A.G. Selfin from Idaho in the Utah area. And the fellows, let's uh, keep it down to about two and a half, three minutes because we're going to be a long time getting through here and we're, uh, I know we want to get you people involved in the discussion too because it has that, this has to be a working convention, not just us standing here talking to you. So hold her down a little bit, will you, A.G.? Yes, thank you. Uh, the area that I have, as you see over there on the pencil, is uh, Idaho, not the northern tip of Idaho. That's in uh, Ray Jorgensen's Washington area, but the, uh, about the, what we call the southern part of Idaho, Utah, the northern part of Utah, and a little bit of two or three counties in eastern Oregon along Snake River. Uh, this area, in this area, we have uh, some fruits that are raised there, apples, peaches, pears, uh, grapes, uh, and this sort of thing. And uh, the, uh, in the irrigated valleys, we raise, uh, of course, potatoes, sugar beets, uh, onions, not all over onions, but we have, we're outstanding for our large size onions for hamburger trade. Uh, the, uh, uh, we raise hay and grain, cattle, etc. But getting back to grain, which I'm in, uh, the kind of grain we raise is uh, uh, raise a lot of high moisture corn that's uh, fed by the feedlots to the cattle out there in finishing your cattle. Uh, in the wheat, we have soft white wheat, uh, we have hard red spring, and we have hard red winter. And also, we have a considerable amount of barley. Uh, our, uh, our barley, excuse me, I came back here to Missouri and picked up one of your coals. It's a, a real good one, too. But anyway, our barley is uh, occasionally sold uh, export, but uh, the export market hasn't been any good this year. So uh, we're going back to uh, selling our barley into the local feedlots uh, to the finished cattle. They feed corn, but they also feed the barley. The wheat is, uh, in our area, all goes uh, either, uh, well, it all goes to the north coast, and a lot of it goes for export. But uh, we ship out by rail, we ship out by truck. If we ship out by truck, we use backhauls of uh, either ma building materials coming in from the coast, Occasionally and seasonally, we use potato. They bring potatoes down from the Washington, Oregon area into uh, central Idaho, and then we haul wheat back. So we do that to be competitive on freight. Uh, if we go out by rail, which we do, we can go to California, and we can go to the northwest coast. Uh, this grain is uh, all the wheat for export is sold to the Great Falls Marketing Office up in Great Falls, Montana, uh, to the buyers that... Uh, we feel we can do the best job for our members. In other words, we're working for you. And I think this is the thing so often, farmers, uh, there are too many members now come up to us and say, what are you paying for wheat? They realize NFO doesn't buy this product. 
But I think they forget that there isn't anybody that you can move your product through that works for you, passes on any profits to you, any extra money that's, that we can get from the buyer, any advantages are passed on to you, not stuck in our pocket, not put in our bank account. And nobody else does this. Our pay system is outstanding. I, I realized the other day when I was working on these tours, going through the grain department, how, how far we've come along. We've come a long ways, baby, as they say. Uh, we started out uh, with a farmer trusting a farmer, and we went down and we sold to the elevator or wherever it was, uh, and we took everybody's word for it. Well, we found out with the wrecks we had, that wasn't businesslike. So then we got down to paper and put it down on paper. You commit to us, we commit to the buyer. And we've improved that paper now to the point where we are doing business for you in a business-like way. We are respected by the buyers and the trade. All we need, folks, is your product. The only problem in NFO is not the product. The problem is the members letting the product be handled by NFO. Thank you for being here. Okay, Charlie Polster. Charlie's from uh, Indiana. Where oh, you got it? <laughs> there you go. You'll notice that they don't fall the state lines exactly. It includes uh, some other marketing areas. Go ahead, John. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Nice being here. In my area, covering about two-thirds of the state of Indiana and most of the state of Kentucky and a little part of Illinois, our basic crops raised in that area is basically corn, soybeans, and some soft red winter wheat. We have, as far as uh, transportation, I think uh, conditions are ideal. We have river, rail, and truck. Markets in the area, we can go either to the Gulf, to the southeast, as far as the uh, <coughs> poultry industry is concerned, by rail, or we can go in the Nearby domestic areas, uh, a lot of uh, livestock and poultry is raised in the southern part of Indiana, uh, in the central part of the area. Of course, there's a little more cattle and hogs. And so what we would like to do a little more of in the future, I think, is uh, pitting the export market against this domestic market and uh, put the pressure on the uh, system so that we can raise that general price level. Now, in order to do this, we need to get more grain signed on the contract for sale so that we know what we have to work with. We can make plans into the future and making advanced uh, sales on both corn, soybeans, and uh, possibly even uh, develop some supply contracts for uh, some of the uh, needs as far as the process is concerned. In Kentucky, there is a pretty good distiller's market, and so uh, they do pay premiums for that type of grain, and I would like to see uh, corn blocked in those areas so that we can go to these type markets and uh, go after some of those premiums. Thanks a lot. If any of you in my area have questions later on, uh, we can get together and make plans for the future. Thank you. Tom Monforton is from the state of Montana. He's our area director from that area. Thank you, Ralph. We, in Montana, where movement has been uh, fair, I guess, not near as much as I'd like to see. I am patient. Uh, we have three facilities that are running quite well. One of them blew down in a, about a hundred mile wind a while ago. The members have got together. They're uh, putting it back up. This is Inverness, Montana, which is moving two or three million bushel a year through it. 
And uh, so we're going there. Our, we're limited up there primarily by transportation. We're in the real rail crunch. We move as much grain as we can physically get out. We're running quite a few NFO hopper cars. We'd like to have another 100 in there probably, but probably won't get it. Uh, but what I came to this convention for is I wanted to see two things. I'm getting impatient to get it done. Uh, I'm getting impatient driving up and down the road, begging people. I wanted to see a commitment from people uh, financially and production-wise to get this thing over the hump and, and get on with what it's all about. And so I hope to heck that we come out of this convention with total commitment of all the people here, both financially and production-wise, so, and go home and get the rest of the people because it does me no good to give a report up here saying how great we're doing in Montana when the price of wheat is $2 lower than we've got to have. So all I can say is for God's sakes, let's get it done. Whenever Warren Marsh gets up to talk, he always talks about over the hill. He's from the East Coast. When he comes across the Appalachians this way, then we are over the hill. So from over the hill in uh, Virginia, Warren Marsh. Hey, your neighbors. Uh, he took my opening remarks. <laughs> so he tells you I'm from the state of Virginia, but I would elect to you to visit with me on the map, and let's start in the state of Pennsylvania, and you'll look in Philadelphia, and you'll find the export markets. Then let's slip down towards the south of Pennsylvania to a little state called Delaware. You'll only find three counties, and in one of those counties, you'll find out that they produce 20-some million bushels of grain. Now, what do we do with this grain? Slip down right on that peninsula, right on down into Maryland, and you will find 11 broiler outfits, chicken outfits. And by Jiminy Crickets, they were 30 cents under the market when NFO entered the southern, uh, the eastern part of the United States. The freight differential between what you guys and our neighbors here in the Midwest shipped the corn into the East Coast, we were 20, 30 to 40 cents under the market. Today, we are not under Ch Chicago. We, our bases are above Chicago because we set up points out there and moved it to the export down in Norfolk, Virginia, and change the whole atmosphere. But we're still a dollar and some cents under the market. I'd like to tell you just one example happened last week. It's an individual, and I think that we are too big to be just an individual. But this guy, when he joined NFO, only farmed two to 300 acres. He thought getting larger was the answer. He now has under his farm operation right in the heart of Virginia, somewhere between four and 5,000 acres. Came in the office the other day, and he says, will you move 10,000 bushel? And what is the price will I receive? And I told him this. It'll either be five cents below, or it'll be five cents above. But now let's sit down and talk about the dollar and a quarter or the dollar and a half that you're losing on that bushel of corn. And by gosh, do you know that gentleman signed up the rest of his grain right then and there? He signed it all up and no questions were asked on price. I think that's what you and I have to understand. Collective bargaining is pricing it, not what will you give me. Jerry Newkirk works in the states of uh, Tennessee. Will you tell it, Jerry? We're the ones that seceded from the union. No, <laughs> no we have, uh, I work in Tennessee, Kentucky. I have a few counties in Illinois, parts of Missouri, Arkansas, 
of Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, the principal crops that we grow in that area are corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, there's milo, cotton, tobacco, and some that we don't put on the contract, uh, moonshine and so forth. But <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> at, <laughs> yeah. We have a system set up in uh, our area that I want to talk about just a little bit. We're quite proud of. Uh, we were some of the first that move into the facilities. We have one at Clarksville, Tennessee, that uh, last year, uh, before its expansion, uh, ran a million bushels through it, and we're looking for greater things out of there. I would like to say that I don't plan to spend a lot of time up here giving you a lot of balahoo. What I want to do is say this. I think we've done a lot of talking. I think it's time to start doing, and I would like to go along with what Tom and the rest of the colleagues up here are having to say, and I'll sit down and let somebody else talk. Thank you. Floyd Mitch is from the state of Ohio. They've had a program working out there, probably been ahead of a lot of the other states for a considerable length of time, and have had coordinators working. Here's Floyd Mitch. Thank you, Ralph. As he stated, we have had coordinators working for years. We have four staff people now in the state of Ohio and 51 coordinators. This varies as we go along, 51, maybe down to 40-some and up to 55, but we have had coordinators probably for about 14 years, and we've maintained this same type of system that was explained here the other night for about 14 years, so it, it is a long, continuing program. Our grain program in the state of Ohio consists mainly, or the backbone of it is, loading barges and rail cars. Now, it was something was said here earlier about affecting the local markets. We bypass the local market, and we also bypass the terminal market. That's the second step. Now, this is with most of our grain. Now, we do have truck to buyer, more or less, as just an outlet for grain that has to be moved or at a time when we do not put a block together for a purpose to move it on the barge or the rail. But the main program is to load barges and load rail cars and move it out of the area, bypass the local elevator and the terminal elevator. Of course, the crops in Ohio mainly are corn, soybeans, and wheat. I think most of you in Ohio have already signed your grain on the contract for sale. Those that haven't, I'm sure you completed it here this morning. So you have already signed your grain in Section 2, so what we would like for you to do before you leave here today is to contact one of our grain coordinators or the grain staff and authorize a portion of that grain that you've got in Section 2 for a definite blocking program that we have. We want to sell a block of soybeans next week to be loaded on a barge in January. So we want everybody in Ohio to commit a portion of their grain in Section 2 before you leave here to go on a barge to be sold next week to be loaded in January. The same with corn. As you heard Leland talk about Michigan, Michigan is going to bring corn from Michigan down to Aurora to load on the barges. So we want the people of Ohio, also with uh, southern Indiana, to block their corn together to go on barges for January. Now our people, we have been affecting the, the price in Ohio now for many years, and our people are getting uneasy about just keep affecting the price. And the main reason we're at this convention and we're hoping to encourage a lot of the rest of the people, let's put enough production together that we quit, we quit affecting the price, we set the price. And as you've heard, that's the goal for March 1st. So let's get enough production committed on these contracts where 
we don't just continually affect the market. We set the price by March 1st, and we'll have a different set of problems from that point on, but I think they'll be more enjoyable than the ones we've had up until this time. Thank you. Ron Mattis is from California. I remember the night when I were working out in California, signed Ron Mattis up. Now he's working with us. <laughs> Proud to have you, Ron. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, the area that I cover is primarily from central, what they call the central California. It's just on the north side of uh, Los Angeles, the Hatchby's, uh, and this area goes clear, my area covers clear into the three southern counties of Oregon. And in that area that I cover, of course, uh, a lot of diversification is there. And the grains that uh, we work with in the program, from malt barley to oats to wheat, corn, milo, and soybeans, and safflower. Now, my counterpart, uh, Frank Enders, that spoke uh, first, as you notice, he mentioned that they are experimenting with soybeans down in his area. Well, they've been experimenting with them in our area or in central California for the last three or four years. They have had more success in our area, like probably because we have a little more humidity and they've been able to come up with a variety that we don't have the shatter problem and, and uh, the production is, is getting to the point where we out there, because of our long growing uh, uh, weather, uh, we have the ability to double crop. So soybeans are definitely going to be a factor in the area that I cover. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're trying to attempt to do out there is to do more uh, bargaining, block bargaining, and uh, that is going to be essential. And as you've heard through the different reports of these fellows, California is a grain deficient state. Uh, grain has to be shipped into California. We don't produce enough of it. It has to come out of Nebraska. It has to come out of uh, Montana, Idaho. Uh, and we even get grain up out of the Pacific Northwest. So here is a prime of example of an organization that we're meeting here in St. Louis that is going to take teamwork because California by itself cannot maintain a price out there for those producers to make a profit. You people in the Midwest have to ship that grain because they need it in California. So we have to work together. One is directly tied to the other. And I think that uh, Ralph said that uh, when he signed me up, you know, uh, a lot of us have, uh, have been patient, and yet we are impatient, and that's exactly what, the way we have to be. And I think financial commitment, production is at, uh, at a time in this organization that we have to get to the point now that we must become impatient and get it done. And uh, all I can say is that we're going to do everything we can in the state of California to make this thing all be brought together. Thank you. Pete Lorenz uh, works in the northern part of uh, Kansas. Before I start, I've got a question for Leland. I want to know how much whiskey it took to get that guy to take the picture from that 140-foot lake. <laughs> uh, I cover north central and northeast Kansas, and the crops that we grow are primarily wheat, milo, soybeans, and corn, and wheat being our major crop. Uh, since we've started the county coordinator program, we've st established 10 county coordinators out of 28, and we feel our structure is growing real well. Uh, we've got a lot of dead areas, but even the dead areas, we're starting to make headway, especially with people that we've never had before. We've got, uh, in the Marysville area, we've got one handling facility at Belleville, about 550,000 bushel capacity. And we're looking at possibly building two handling facilities uh, for trackside loading. And this is a, a member idea with the idea that we feel that we can load cars for three cents a bushel. Now the attitude in, in Kansas, uh, since I've been down there in the last year, is almost like night and day. Uh, we're, we've tripled our volume in the last year, and the members are, are excited about what's happening. Uh, I'm a little nervous up here, but one of the things I felt like saying is that there's been a lot of talk that people will go if we can get Kansas to go. Uh, don't turn around. We're going to walk right over you. Thank you. Well, 
Al Meetsick. Works in the western Kansas and eastern Colorado area. Thank you, Ralph, and good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Okay, the Sterling area. What does it consist of? Well, there's something like 17 counties in western Kansas and about 22 in Colorado, which pretty well covers the eastern half of Colorado. What's raised? It's quite diversified. Wheat, hard winter, corn, milo, edible beans, millet, sugar beets, cattle, hogs, and some sheep. Markets, wheat, everything relates to the Kansas City market. 